Okay. Welcome to our first Ask a Physicist of 2023. We will get started in just a minute, but uh, before we do, I would like to make sure everyone knows that we will be doing this um, for the rest of the semester, the last Monday of the month. So that makes next month's February 27th, and it will be at our usual time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And I will send out the usual emails and social media announcements uh, with registration links once that's open. And then our other exciting announcement is that we have our Beyond Annual Lecture coming up on March 2nd, and it is our premier public event of the year. And it will be given by Stefan Alexander, who is a theoretical physicist who explores the connections between music, physics, mathematics, and technology. It is in person on Tempe campus uh, in Nepal at 7 p.m., as you can see on the poster. Registration is currently open. Um, you can find that on our website at beyond.asu.edu, or I will also be sending out the emails and social media announcements with direct links to that as well. So for tonight, um, unfortunately, Sarah Walker won't be able to join us, but we still have Paul Davies and Damian Eason. And um, this is being recorded. It will be posted to YouTube, YouTube later on in the week if you want to watch it again or share it with somebody who you think is interested. We will get to questions towards the end of the hour, but if you have any questions during the talk at all, you can ask them using the Q&A feature on your screen. So I think that's all I have. I will go ahead and turn it over to the director of the Beyond Center, Paul Davies. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everybody, um, and uh, happy 2023. So we've got an exciting uh, program of uh, Ask a Physicist sessions coming up. And in this first one, we're going to tackle a subject that is well known in science fiction, uh, the subjects of wormholes in space. But before we uh, chip into that, let me just explain how we'll do things today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background. Uh, what are wormholes and why are we interested in them? Uh, and then my colleague, Damien Easton, will talk a, a little bit about his uh, active research in this area and about some of the puzzles and unsolved problems. Uh, and then maybe after a bit of conversation, we will uh, turn to your questions. And so uh, I'd like to start just by giving a bit of context. Now, it's probably no exaggeration to say that one of the uh, greatest discoveries this century, certainly so far, uh, occurred in 2015 uh, with the I'm going to share my screen with the work of this uh, of this instrument here, LIGO, Laser Interferometer Gravitation Observatory. Uh, and this is a, a picture of one. Um, there are two of these uh, form part of LIGO, and there's some in, uh, these are both in the United States, there's some in other countries as well. Uh, and the, these have been searching for many, many years for gravitational waves. Now, uh, what are they? They're literally ripples in the fabric of space-time. Now, I'm trying to advance my slides and it won't go, probably because I'm being too clever in bringing up the first slide without asking for the slideshow. So I'll just exit from this and uh, from beginning. And now it should work, yes. Um, so gravitational waves are, are nothing but ripples in space itself. Uh, they spread out at the speed of light uh, and can carry enormous amounts of energy transported across the universe. But because gravitation is such a weak force, detecting gravitational waves, even with large amounts of energy, uh, has proved an enormous challenge. In fact, it took just about 100 years uh, since uh, this paper uh, by Einstein predicting the existence of gravitational waves. So he realized uh, that in his new general theory of relativity, uh, that uh, there must be some sort of wave-like uh, pattern. We know gravitation can be thought of as a warping or a distortion in the geometry of space-time. And so if 
the source of the gravitational field changes, then this causes a sort of rippling effect of the curvature. And uh, it, from Einstein's original calculations and much work that's been done since, it's clear that these propagate at the speed of light. Uh, so it's always been uh, a fascination of physicists to think, uh, could we actually detect these gravitational waves? Uh, and the, the reason that that's important is because they literally open up a new window on the universe because gravitational waves can penetrate through regions of space that might be blocked to light or radio waves, uh, enabling us to, in effect, find out what is going on in systems where there's extreme gravitational activity, but shrouded by uh, matter, maybe high energy matter as well. Uh, and the, um, the archetypal event, and in fact, the first event to be discovered uh, was uh, the effect of two black holes spiraling together. So black holes can sometimes be found in binary systems, and when this happens, uh, they orbit each other, uh, but because they're emitting gravitational waves, the orbit decays. So they enter a sort of death spiral until uh, they, they go faster and faster until they're moving at nearly the speed of light. And then, you know, one horrendous day, uh, they, uh, they hit each other and merge. And uh, then the single black hole that results from that sort of shudders around in a very distinctive way and a huge amount of energy is given off. And this was indeed what was observed in 2015. And this is the waveform that LIGO measured at the two uh, observatories, one at Hanford and one at Livingston. Uh, you see a quite a distinctive type of pattern. And from that pattern, this is in effect, um, the sound of space vibrating. And from that pattern, it's possible to deduce the masses of the black holes, the final mass, uh, something about the, uh, the, the ringing, or um, if you think of, of the merged black hole as a bit like a disturbed sort of lump of jello, that it's gonna wobble around, uh, but that wobbling itself emits huge amounts of gravitational radiation. And so uh, from, from the pattern of the waveform, it's possible to infer something about the structure and the changes of space-time. Uh, well, uh, black holes are only one example of uh, massively gravitating objects in the universe. And you might wonder, well, what else is out there uh, which would have distinctive gravitational wave uh, forms like this, or not like this, They're different because they would not be black holes. Um, one idea that's been around for quite a while are cosmic strings. Oh, there, there are the black holes spiraling together, uh, are cosmic strings. And that these are uh, enormously massive, uh, very narrow threads, purely hypothetical, but some people think they might have formed in the early universe. And um, because of the enormous amount of energy and the, uh, and the huge tension in these strings, they could thrash around and move at almost at the speed of light and would be a prolific source of gravitational waves. Um, and so that's one other thing that we could look for. But the one we're all here this evening to learn about uh, is a, a wormholes. Um, is it uh, possible that there are wormholes out there in space? Uh, and these would be massive uh, gravitating objects, intense gravitational fields as well. And if they engage in any sort of activity, then we might expect they, they too would have a distinctive gravitational wave pattern. And it could be that at LIGO or one of the other gravitational wave detectors Sometime soon, somebody will see a funny looking waveform and deduce that this is not um, black holes, but wormholes producing that type of activity. That's, that's the hope. Now, the idea of wormholes, I should explain well, the background to it, goes back to this gentleman here, the late great John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, he was the person who coined the term black hole, and he also invented the idea of wormholes, called them wormholes, back in the 1950s. So this is an old idea. And in essence, uh, a, a wormhole, of course, a real wormhole, that is a wormhole from a real worm, um, would be a hole in the ground. The worm might burrow down in one place and come up somewhere else. And so it would provide a sort of tunnel or tube connecting 
uh, two, two points in your backyard um, by alternative routes. One would be down through the tunnel and the other would be across the surface. Uh, and Wheeler had the idea that this might happen in space time, but because in the general theory of relativity, space is elastic, it could be that the distance between two points going through the wormhole is less than what it would be going through just the regular space. Uh, that was the, the idea underpinning this. Um, but uh, it's very difficult for people to envisage because of course, we, uh, when you look at pictures, uh, these pictures are inevitably showing the geometry in two space-time dimensions, whereas we live in three dimensions. So you see pictures like this, uh, you can see lots of these sorts of things on the internet, and the wormhole is that, is that sort of tunnel that goes down and then connects up with another region of, of space. Um, and that other region might be some far-flung region of our own universe, or it might be another universe entirely. Uh, the, both of these are possibilities that have been discussed in science fiction, but also uh, in scientific publications as well. Um, but that um, uh, sort of tube-looking thing, you have to remember that it's a representation of what is really going on in three dimensions. So we might expect the mouth of a wormhole, well, it's got two, one at each end, the mouth of a wormhole uh, to be a spherical object. Uh, now, uh, one way of envisaging what a wormhole might be, you might have seen the movie Stargate. And here is the Stargate. And in the movie, when the gate is open, uh, people can leap through and they come out somewhere else, um, not just on the other side of the building, but maybe the other side of the galaxy, something of that sort. So a wormhole is a bit like a stargate. Uh, and if you uh, wonder what does a wormhole actually look like, like if you're traveling through it, um, well, you should ask Jodie Foster because in the movie Contact, uh, she's shown uh, racing through a wormhole to a, uh, in, a, in 18 minutes. Uh, reaching the star uh, Vega um, uh, by, by this uh, mechanism. And uh, to me, it looked like she was sort of plunging through the London underground. If any of you have had a tube ride in London, you'll know uh, what it feels like, what it looks like. So that, uh, that was my impression. Uh, but of course, it was entirely science fiction. We have no idea what it would be like. But the essence of, uh, of this is that the wormhole is traversable. Uh, and this is the important point that we're going to dwell on, um, because black hole, the wormhole, they sound the same, but they're very different in one important respect. A black hole is a one-way journey to, to nowhere. If Jodie Foster fell into a black hole, she would be obliterated and could never come out. Uh, and, uh, and so a wormhole has an exit as well as an entrance. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, the light can pass through it, so we could look through it and see another bit of the universe on the other, other side, uh, and in principle could travel through it. Uh, and the notion of a traversable wormhole, which really goes back to Wheeler's original idea, um, uh, became very popular after, or well, around about the time of this movie. And the reason for that is because uh, this was a science fiction idea. The movie was based on the book by Carl Sagan, the great uh, astronomy popularizer. Uh, and he wanted to know, could it really be done? A wormhole is just a sort of convenient invention. Is it actually possible to connect two points, uh, distant points uh, in space to make a shortcut like that? And uh, Kip Thorne at uh, Caltech and his colleagues then investigated it. And the answer was yes, but in order to prevent the wormhole turning into a black hole, uh, you have to keep open the, the bit in the middle, we call that the throat of the wormhole, has to be kept open. And that can only happen with some sort of exotic material that is in effect anti-gravitating. Because there's a natural tendency for these space-time structures to collapse on black holes. But to keep the throat of the wormhole open, you need something like negative energy or negative pressure, some sort of, something that has a, basically a negative mass and anti-gravitates. Um, now, you might think, well, that's totally conjectural. Uh, it's, it's not completely, because we know in quantum physics, in the quantum theory of fields, it is indeed possible to have negative uh, energy, 
negative masses. This, uh, this is known to be possible, but in pitifully small amounts. So anything that you can do in the lab to demonstrate these negative effects uh, wouldn't do much to help Jodie Foster on her journey. So you have to have a sort of leap of the imagination that somehow um, there's some physics that says uh, that there's no limit to the amount of this negative stuff uh, that might uh, might be be deployed uh, if if you were going to make a wormhole artificially. That is, if some super civilization decided to engineer such a thing. But of course, it's always possible that the Big Bang coughed out wormholes right at the beginning. In other words, uh, the universe came threaded with these tunnels right, right from the Big Bang itself. Uh, we can't rule that out. Uh, but that would only be the case if this sort of negative anti-gravitating stuff is a reality. And at the moment, it's, it's uh, just largely conjecture. Um, but anyway, uh, let's uh, uh, be optimistic and suppose that there are wormholes out there. Maybe huge wormholes. Remember, there are black holes that have billions of solar masses. So these are monster black holes. Maybe they're monster wormholes as well. And then the question is, how would they manifest themselves? And there's been a lot of work, well, say a lot, some work done on, you know, what would they look like and what would they do to light in uh, their vicinity and so on. Um, but I've raised the subject of gravitational waves because that interests me. Um, what uh, type of gravitational waves might we expect from a wormhole? Well, uh, I've written four ideas down here just off the top of my head. One of these is um, that the wormhole might not remain stable and open in the manner in the movie, uh, obligingly, uh, once Jodie Foster goes through it, it might well oscillate or pulsate in some way. And that would uh, create prolific gravitational radiation. Then there's another curious feature that if um, an object falls into a black hole, say a neutron star or something, for, I'm sorry, falls into a wormhole, um, because of the anti-gravity and the throat of the wormhole, it may not traverse it, it may actually bounce back off because there's an anti-gravitational force, bounce back again. But if um, the outer region around the wormhole has a positive mass, then that would positively gravitate. So that creates a uh, what we call a potential well, a gravitational potential well, where this uh, object will bounce backwards and forwards in and out of the throat of the wormhole uh, in a periodic manner, emitting lots and lots of gravitational waves. It would eventually settle down uh, in, and would be emitting more or less pure sine waves coming uh, from this trapped region. And so you might expect if there is a wormhole of, of this sort, that over time it would accumulate uh, a sort of a shroud of these objects uh, surrounding it, which would be trapped in these oscillating, radially oscillating patterns. So uh, that might be rather distinctive and that's something to look for. And then we can think about, well, what about the black hole, black hole collisions? What happens if a, a black hole and a wormhole collide? Does the black hole swallow the wormhole or does the wormhole swallow the black hole or does something else entirely happen? Uh, I have no idea. Maybe Damien is going to tell us in a moment. Um, and then, of course, there's the possibility of wormholes colliding with other wormholes and even the possibility of the two wormhole ends somehow meeting uh, together. And what would that do? It sort of disappears up its own wormhole. And I have no idea uh, what, whether it uh, uh, just creates a little baby universe or just disappears entirely. But whatever it is, the release of energy would be a, a great, a prolific burst of gravitational waves. So that's something else that we could look for. Now, I'm going to wrap this up um, because I'd like to give Damien a go, but a couple of things I want to mention. Um, although these giant uh, Jody Foster type wormholes are um, really very conjectural. There is one type of wormhole that almost all theoretical physicists agree are really there. And that is on the ultra microscopic scale known as the Planck scale. That's uh, about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Um, and this actually was Wheeler's uh, more serious contribution because he noted, well, it goes back to Max Planck really, because we call this the Planck length scale, um, but there, John Wheeler noted that on that scale, the quantum fluctuations of space-time would be so intense that it would change the topology, creating these wormholes and bridges and things. 
but it wouldn't, they wouldn't be stable. It would be a sort of restless um, seething activity of uh, wormholes, bridges, tunnels, and other topological features forming and uh, decaying, forming and decaying, maybe even little baby universes budding off, nobody quite knows. Uh, but I did float this idea that uh, a super, a future, or maybe a present super civilization um, might want to engineer a wormhole. And one way of doing that would be uh, if you could somehow reach down into the space-time foam. We, we can't do this yet. We're 20 orders of magnitude away. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN can get down to something about 20 powers of 10 bigger than the Planck length. But who knows what a super civilization could do? Could you get down into that picture there and grab hold of one of those wormholes and then inflate it up um, to everyday dimension? So there's some physical mechanism that would inflate it, or would it self-inflate? You know, is this anti-gravity, is there a field that would sort of naturally self-amplify? I'm, I'm just making this up, um, but, uh, but, but who knows? Um, anyway, it was enough, that idea was enough for me to write a somewhat fanciful book on this, and it's called um, How to Build a Time Machine. And uh, the point about the title there is that uh, Kip Thorne and his colleagues soon discovered that if indeed there were wormholes joining two points in space to form a shortcut, they could be turned into time machines. Um, and this is uh, more or less how you do it. You see there's Jodie Foster again going through the wormhole. Um, the, the point uh, being that there's a wormhole connecting two distant points in space, that if you bring up a neutron star uh, to one of the wormhole mouths, uh, then the, the gravitational effect of the neutron star slows time in its vicinity. And the two different ends of the wormhole, A and B, get out of kilter. That's uh, temporarily speaking, temporally speaking, uh, the clocks uh, that uh, did tick at different rates. And so after a while, you might find a permanent time difference between the two ends. And then if you travel through the wormhole uh, and then uh, in one direction, you might travel say 100 years into the future. If you go through it in the other direction, you travel 100 years into the past. And then you could zoom back uh, home, not through the wormhole, but through the conventional path in space and get back before you left. Uh, and that unleashes all of the causal paradoxes that people who are familiar with time travel stories uh, will, will know all about. Um, and those paradoxes, most physicists think, are uh, so devastating that we have to rule out wormholes just on the basis that they will permit time travel. The person who made the biggest deal of this was Stephen Hawking, uh, who proposed something called a chronology protection hypothesis, which was intended to rule out any possibility of any type of travel back into the past, not just by a person, but any, any sort of physics, any signal, even one particle, not allowed to go back in time because of the causal chaos that it would unleash if you could loop back in time as well as loop around in space. And I'm just gonna finish with a humorous uh, slide, a slide of a humorous episode in which uh, Stephen um, decided to uh, test the idea of time travel. And he held a party in Cambridge to welcome time travelers. Uh, it was a dinner party and he was there with the champagne and the and the nibbles and everything. And he sat there on his own for an hour or so uh, and nobody came. Uh, so he concluded that time travel uh, is uh, probably impossible. Um, but of course there could be many reasons that time travelers chose not to visit Stephen on that occasion. Uh, I'll leave it with you as, as a possible puzzle. I just want to say that if we're confronting the idea of wormholes in space as a serious proposition, then we can't avoid also having to confront the deeply troubling notion of time travel into the past. And at that point, seems a good topic to stop on and hand over to uh, Damien. And then he and I will engage in a bit of conversation. And I see I've already used up half of the time allocated. So uh, sorry, Damien, trespassing on your, your um, spot here, but do go ahead. I got to stop sharing my screen. All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is that... Yep. Okay, great. 
Great. So I, I thank you for the excellent uh, introduction there, Paul. <laughs> I uh, takes a lot of the work out for me. So uh, as Paul has noted, right, these wormholes are uh, very fun to speculate about, right? These are solutions of Einstein's theory of general relativity. These are geometric solutions, right? They have the, the throat and then these, what we would say, two mouths. Uh, and again, Paul had a nice uh, picture there. Uh, and really the, the wonderful thing about them, uh, if they are real, is, is that you could use them in some way to connect you know, distant parts of the universe, which are otherwise completely inaccessible because just because of the fact that we have, uh, from again, from Einstein, um, we know that we can't really travel uh, at speeds, you know, that are at the speed of light, right? So the, we can connect with these wormholes in theory, these very distant parts of the universe, and it, it opens up a whole uh, bunch of possibilities for, for interstellar travel, which you've seen in the movies. Um, yeah, so not just contact with the, the movie Interstellar, I think there's also a bunch of uh, wormholes in there as well. Uh, but as, as Paul has also noted, there the difficulty is uh, in the context of Einstein gravity that the to keep the wormhole open because gravity tends to want to make everything uh, collapse. But to keep the wormhole open, we need some sort of uh, negative energy density type material, which no one has uh, any good ideas about how to to construct or build, or even if it would be possible to create uh, such such things other than at the quantum level. Uh, and, but, but they're fun. It's fun to conjecture about these things. And that, that one comment I should say also is a little bit dependent on the fact that Einstein gravity is, is the correct theory. So, uh, it, it's, it's all, there's no reason to think that it's not the correct theory, right? Everything that we ha have, uh, measured experimentally so far seems to indicate that certainly it is it works very well and you know, all the experiments that we've ever done uh, but you never know what could happen in very early universe um, before we have experimental data um, and physics might have behaved somewhat differently and so again what like Paul's picture there with the quantum foam uh, one possibility another which comes from cosmology is the idea that we we may have uh, the universe may have undergone a, a very rapid period of expansion, uh, very early times, very high energies. Uh, and this we call inflation. It does a bunch of good things for us in the in the cosmology world. Right? It solves a bunch of uh, technical difficulties we have with the standard Big Bang model. Uh, and one could imagine very small objects, uh, like a small wormhole somehow inflating all of a sudden and growing into something macroscopic. That's a possibility. Um, these wormholes, as for seeing if these things were there observationally, right? The, the gravitational waves is an amazing way to, to do that. Uh, there are other ways you could imagine detecting these kinds of objects, of course. Uh, for example, if you have a, a large massive object in another universe, that, that could communicate gravitationally with our universe. And so one could, in principle, look for deviations of uh, orbits of various objects that are, you know, things that are behaving strangely uh, in our own universe uh, that could be perhaps attributed to uh, mass in in a different universe or a different part of our universe. Um, there are ideas of the way that light bends around the mouths of these wormholes can be different from what you might expect in an ordinary black hole. Uh, and people talk about photon shadows right this so this spheres of light of of background objects that are uh you know photons light that's moving that are moving around the mouths of these wormholes and, and it can have a slightly different appearance than just what you'd expect in from uh, ordinary black holes and now with other things such as telescopes like the event horizon telescope uh, we are able to go in principle and look uh, at these different types of shadows and and see what we we might find. Um, I don't know, Paul. Was there other anything else? Yeah. Well, say? there's there's one general point that I think is worth uh, raising because it gets right to the heart of this whole conjecture. Uh, and the reason you can do the conjecture is because 
Einstein gave us this wonderful theory that connects the geometry of space-time with the matter in the space-time, technically the stress energy momentum tensor. So one's on the left-hand side of Einstein's equations, one's on the right-hand side of Einstein's equations. And um, uh, you can invent any geometry you like uh, on the left-hand side and solve the equations and find out the property of the matter that would support that geometry. Um, and of course, mostly that matter, the properties of that hypothetical matter will be unpalatable. Uh, and I mentioned already about you know, large uh, negative energies and so on. Um, and many physicists think that um, that, that uh, doesn't sound too good. Um, but the point is that Einstein's, it, his theory is incomplete in the sense that he gave us these field equations, tells you how matter curves space time, but didn't say anything about the, the matter. It can be anything, anything you like in, in that theory, it's unrestricted. And so in practice, what we do, we augment the, the uh, gravitational field equations with what are often called energy conditions. Uh, such as uh, no negative energy. Um, in fact, for ordinary, like classical matter, like the Earth, um, it's always got positive energy, positive pressure, and, and so on. But um, we, we know a, a one case where uh, things are very different, and that is the dark energy that is causing the universe to accelerate faster and faster. That has a negative pressure, although it's got a positive energy, it has a negative pressure. And because uh, in Einstein's equations, pressure comes in with a factor of three, the three negative pressures beat the positive energy density and the whole thing anti-gravitates. And the reason the universe ex is expanding faster and faster and faster is that anti-gravitational push. So, um, you know, here's a clear cut example of where the energy, original energy conditions uh, are in fact violated. Um, but what we're talking about now is not some I mean, the reason it works in the universe, it's a very tiny amount of negative uh, pressure, but there's a, it's a big universe, so it all adds up to a lot in, in total. Uh, what you want for a wormhole is to concentrate something like that dark energy, uh, in many, many orders of magnitude concentrated and have it inside the, the wormhole. And so um, we, we, it doesn't stop with wormholes. We could invent any space-time we like and say, well, that would exist if this following type of matter existed. And because we don't have a theory that unifies gravitation and matter, from quantum version uh, of matter, we don't have that uh, theory, at least in any uh, worked out form that we can agree on, um, this remains entirely open. And it's hard to see how we're ever gonna make progress on this unless we either, on one hand, discover uh, an actual real wormhole out there, and then that would settle the point, or on the other, come up with some sort of uh, better version, but preferably a totally unified version of gravitation and the other forces and quantum physics and everything else. Um, and then we would know from the theory what types of matter are allowed. And then we would be able to say, yes, you could have a wormhole if you could produce this or that type of quantum state, and uh, some advanced civilization might attempt to do that. Or on the other hand, you might say, no, under no circumstances, there's sort of no go theorem, could you ever have such a wormhole? And that would then vindicate Hawking's chronology protection hypothesis, uh, if we were able to prove that. But so far, it's, it's unproven. And if there are any students out there who are fired up and think, well, this is a great thing to work on, we need somebody to try to prove or disprove the chronology protection hypothesis. It, it's probable that what would happen is the quantum field effects inside the wormhole would escalate without limit and uh, uh, become almost infinite and their own gravitational effects would, would then counter the negative energy in the wormhole. But nobody's, nobody's proved this uh, in, the, in a general sense. And so it's an open question. So I'm just sort of rambling on here, but I did want to make that point that you can you, you can invent the space-time structure that's fun to think about, and then uh, from Einstein's equations you you deduce the type of matter that uh, should produce it, and it's not a type of matter that we is lying around in the lab.
uh, in not <laughs> that's right <laughs> I mean, yes, but, but I do think it is important to also re to remember that the way, so when Einstein's equation says the, the the geometry that you get, in this case, the wormhole is is generated by a certain type of matter, the uh, that really is, that is dependent on the, the theory, on his theory, right, on, on Einstein's theory of relativity. But yes. one could also a matter, one could imagine at least other theories of gravity that uh, the, the the exact way in which the geometry is generated by energy uh, might be different. Right. It might right. be different. It might be different in a way that 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 sort of matter is is acceptable <laughs> to people, whatever that means, or physically reasonable. Yeah. In fact, you could even possibly support the structure with simply the the what we say the vacuum of the theory with no matter at all. But of right. course, this would be some rather exotic theory that this could happen in. But but we can write those theories down. I've done it and other people have done it as well, I'm sure. Uh, and again, but of course, they they don't seem to represent our universe, at least in the way that we know it currently. Uh, but as an existence proof, right, these things can, the, the, the theories are known. These things are out there. Yes, uh, and it's worth uh, mentioning to our listeners, viewers, um, that there are many uh, uh, generalizations of Einstein's theory or other contenders. Of course, what you want if you're going to dream up such a theory is something that would agree with general relativity under most of the circumstances that we can currently investigate, because it is very well tested in a wide range of uh, astrophysical contexts. So you don't want to muck around with it too much. But um, I don't think anybody thinks it's the last word for the simple reason that it is not consistent with quantum mechanics and that something is has got to give and it could be that there, there are tiny corrections uh, of some sort to the general theory of relativity uh, too tiny for us to notice in the experiments that, and observations we do at the moment but that might uh, become all dominant in a wormhole type scenario so so these things um, are, are all out there as possibilities now, I wonder if we should tackle some of the questions because uh, we can always resume our discussion. Um, first of all, um, uh, our most loyal, uh, beyond the uh, ask a, a physicist uh, follower, Barbara Temple, has sent some questions in in advance. And I think we've actually dealt with them. Um, can we stabilize a wormhole long enough to safely traverse it? And so, of course, we mentioned that you need this type of anti-gravity to keep the wormhole open. Um, and I did say, well, the, the throat might undergo pulsations or something. Um, and obviously, there is a stability issue. So it's one thing to open up uh, a tunnel from one part of the universe to another, quite another, to keep it open long enough to traverse it. So that's, that's still a, an unanswered question. Yeah, um, if if then, you if you accept that strange sort of matter, then I su suppose the answer is we, we you could do it. But it, the question is, do you find, do we you know we no one has any idea if that sort of matter is something we can create, right? Or how long it you know might do its stuff? Uh, whether the whole thing would be unstable and uh, would uh, uh, collapse on the on the time traveler or space traveler uh, as they pass through. Um, as you also would like to know. Uh, uh, where, where the wormhole leads, can you know this in advance? And I think just pick up the point that we were just making. You can invent anything you like in general relativity and then go back and ask, you know, what type of matter uh, supports it. So the uh, Einstein gave us this wonderful theory that explains gravitation in terms of geometry. Um, but uh, there's nothing, as far as I know, nothing in the theory to fix the topology of the space. Uh, and so what we're dealing here is curvature, of course, uh, as you go through the wormhole, but the connectedness of the space can be anything you want. And so the two ideas that are around, one is that uh, it, like in the movie scenario, connecting two uh, distant points within our universe, but the other is connecting to another region of space altogether, which is otherwise not connected to our universe, another universe, if you like. Uh, and, and that's an idea that sometimes comes up in discussions of uh, what are often called baby universes. You'll remember the 
the picture I showed with all the wormholes and bridges, and they're little blobs. And, and so according to uh, uh, general ideas of quantum mechanics, you could have another universe sort of nucleating itself down at that uh, space-time foam level. And some people, uh, so I say people, I mean, some of our colleagues in theoretical physics have conjectured that maybe when a black hole forms and uh, evaporates via the Hawking process, maybe it's nucleating a bubble universe connected through the black hole by a wormhole. So um, if you fall into the black hole, you don't hit a singularity and disappear. You would uh, get, literally go through this wormhole into this new baby universe that then might expand out and, uh, and go through a life cycle much like our universe. So, uh, I often say this is like the ultimate in emigration. If you're sick of this universe, leave it for good by going through a wormhole into a baby universe that's got better prospects uh, and you probably couldn't come back again because when the black hole evaporates, the wormhole uh, will pinch up. So um, uh, anyway, so the, the answer to Barbara's question, uh, we don't know in advance where it leads. We can sort of make it up. Um, and uh, she uh, finally she asks, could we create a wormhole uh, safely? Um, and, and I think we really have dealt with that. We've got a sort of vague idea about uh, how it might be done, but, um, but actually achieving it is well beyond our tech level of technology, but it may not be beyond that of a super civilization that's been around for billions of years. Uh, whether it can be done safely or not is another matter. Uh, you'll Wait, remember, what, yeah, for sure. Remember my slide, uh, showing the, the book title with the uh, warning, don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One, uh, I mean, one thing else I'll just say is that the, the throat of the wormhole could, can be made fairly short. And it, you could imagine concocting a situation that you could look in and actually see things in this, either in this other universe or distant parts of the, of, of our universe, uh, stars and such, the light from that coming through. Right. So it's possible. Uh, I mean, at least it, it can be. We can write it down, right? Uh, where you can we, see where you can see where you're going when you go jump in. I'm I'm perusing the uh, other questions that have come in as you speak, um, and there uh, I, I won't attempt to sort of curate them. I'll just take them as they come. Uh, can anyone tell me the behavior of light when there is gravity? And the simple answer is gravity bends light. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to say that uh, just a few months ago, I was able to go to Western Australia. They were celebrating the centenary of the eclipse in 1922, that uh, solar eclipse that passed over the northern part of Western Australia. And there was an expedition from the University of Western Australia that went there to measure the bending of light. And the the folklore is that this was done by Arthur Eddington in 1919 when there was an eclipse. Uh, it's a tiny effect because it's the sun's gravity that's bending it, it and the sun, uh, it, its gravity is much more than the Earth, but it's feeble compared to things like black holes. Uh, but it was the, the Australian one that really nailed the effect and um, uh, to everybody's satisfaction, including the Perth Mint, uh, they decided to mint a special coin to commemorate this centenary. Uh, I have one uh, in my house. And so, um, so the answer is when this gravity light is bent um, and this bending of light effect is most extreme in the case of black holes. And you might've seen some of these artists' impressions of what a black hole looks like. Well, of course the black hole is black, but the light from the regions around it can be bent in convoluted in a very extreme way, leading to all sorts of weird looking uh, images and so you can look that up so i think i've probably dealt with that you don't want to say anything more on that topic do you then uh no, not really other than yes please yeah you should whoever is asking the question should definitely look up the bending of light around uh you can see gravitationally in uh gravi gravitationally lensed images of uh distant galaxies by very massive objects and it's great right uh, okay. the way the way the light bends is also very specific to the the theory that you're thinking about, which in most cases is general relativity. So it's another way for us also to distinguish between different possible gravitational theories is how, how these images are bent exactly. There, there's one uh, particular set of images called Einstein rings where 
the if a massive object interposes itself along our line of sight with some distant glowing object, the glowing object, the light from it is focused by the intermediate object in such a way that it produces, uh, it, it smeared out the image of the distant object, our galaxy, is smeared out to form a ring around the uh, dark interposing object. And there's a number of pictures you can find on the internet of these Einstein rings, a very dramatic example of the bending of light by, by gravity. Now and we come to, sorry. I was just going to say, and in fact, that was that was one of Einstein's major predictions of his theory was that light should be bent, should bend right. a right. gravitational field. So one of the first uh, major observational um, corroborations of, of his right. theory. In fact, if I remember my history correctly, he even thought of this before he produced the general theory of relativity with his so-called falling elevator experiment. Oh, is that right? No, that, I, didn't, that, I didn't know the, that. The light was going to be path, uh, that a photon passing through the elevator would appear to be on a bent path. But anyway, Jason Pratt uh, asks, um, will advances in quantum computing lead to uh, advances in our understanding of cosmology and physics? Um, well, I would, I would hope so. Um, most people think of quantum computing as being um, needed to uh, break codes or something of that sort. Uh, but uh, the original idea, uh, going back to Richard Feynman, was that uh, quantum computers would be an excellent way of uh, modeling quantum physics. Uh, I think he had in mind particularly uh, molecular processes and so on. But um, uh, it's entirely likely that uh, anywhere that there is there are quantum effects at work of a complicated nature, quantum computers would help unravel it. But I don't have any work specifically uh, that might be directed at cosmology. But if you've got a better computer, it's got to be better for the subject. Um, now, shall I just uh, carry on because I've got the questions in front of me. So. Uh, Jim Benford asks, are there any detailed predictions of what wormhole observables will be? And, and, there, and I know, Damien, you'll probably know better than I do. There, there has certainly been work on, you know, what would they look like uh, through a telescope or something. And I'm not that familiar because I was focusing on the gravitational wave aspect. But, but could you tell if there was a wormhole in our galaxy? Yeah, uh, I mean, so again, if you could if you could see one of these things, there there are very the way that light bends around them can be different from from black holes. There are uh, examples of wormholes that are covered by a horizon which mimic black holes and therefore would probably be indistinguishable from th those. Of course, you could only go in and not be able to come back out because it would have a horizon. Uh, but uh, but there are other ones. Uh, can be horizonless, and you can traverse back and forth. And, and the way that light bends around those things, the geometry—it's—it's it's just a, it's a, we say a different metric. It's a different. Uh, it's uh, it has unique, in principle, unique, uh, more unique si signatures for the way that light should bend. So, what about uh, colors? I mean, would a wormhole, uh, you know, show a whole spectrum of colors? We were talking about the Einstein ring bending of light. Uh, by a massive object, um, but if different wavelengths are bent by different amounts, would that you know might might wormholes appear in Technicolor? Uh, I'm just <laughs> you know, I'm making this up. <laughs> no, I, I well I don't I'm not aware of any work on that particularly, but it is possible. I'm not yeah um, I I don't know. I haven't thought about it. The um, I mean I can say the the shadow of the of of the wormhole is is often can be distinguishable from that of a, of a black hole. So the meaning the background light that is coming around. And I've seen some interesting uh, work done there and, and simulations of what, what it would, what we'd expect to see possibly. Um, Before wormholes became uh, a, a fashionable recreation among theoretical physicists, people sometimes talked about white holes, which are like the time reversal of black holes. And, and, conjectured that maybe uh, objects, massive exploding objects were actually white holes with stuff spewing out into the universe, having fallen in from some other universe. Uh, and um, uh, in a way that uh, presaged the idea of a wormhole 
it, if it's traversable, it's traversable in both directions. And so uh, we could imagine one of the signatures of wormholes being um, a whole lot of stuff pouring into our universe from somewhere else. Uh, who knows? Um, okay, um, let's uh, move on down because there are a few questions and we're running out of time. Um, uh, Tori Battelle says, could you please comment on the uh, Spiro Pulu? I don't have to pronounce her name properly. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and team, and team uh, witnessing the emergence of a wormhole from qubits stored in superconducting circuits and then sending information through the wormhole. It's a paper in Nature. Right. Well, that's a very uh, a liberal interpretation of the notion of wormhole. Um, uh, Damien, do you know anything about it? I know just I, a little bit. I can't say. I only, no, I mean, short answer is no. <laughs> I've, I've right. seen it. I, I'm afraid I don't. I, I think I know enough to make a fool of myself, uh, but I think it. this had, uh, uh, so in quantum mechanics, you have these um, uh, sort of time machine states where there's entanglement across time. And it makes it, uh, we're used to the idea of enta quantum entanglement across space. You have entanglement across time. Um, and uh, you can't ever send information back in time, but it's there's still some sort of quantum link. And I think what was being, um, the, 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 the experiment being done in the supercomputer was a way of establishing that, that that phenomenon is real. I wouldn't really call it a wormhole but it, you know it's in the spirit of being able to reach back in, into the past in some way but uh, but I, I may be uh i'm sorry tori if i'm uh completely off target with those comments but uh, you can come along and ask a physicist that these things you can always ask anything you like we're not guaranteed to answer all of the questions we try our best um so let's go on to what nicolette has to say um, are there any competing theories for Einstein's relativity? You have your eye on it this time. Well, Damien, you do. Uh, you mentioned it. So can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, well, I mean, it's competitor, it's, there's a lot that we have to think about, right? When we know um, exactly, we know that Einstein relativity has to be modified at some point at, at very early time. So at some, when we get up towards the... Uh, you know, high energies or very small uh, distances when we're getting up uh, near the conditions that would have been uh, around the time of the Big Bang, right, uh, or before, uh, then we know that there have to be some sort of modifications to the to the standard picture for Einstein gravity. Also, indications from the fact that uh, it's not a quantizable theory, which Paul has already mentioned. Um, and so the, I don't know, um, so certainly things have to look like Einstein gravity today, no matter what your your favorite gravity theory might be, uh, because we do have, as Paul mentioned, these very tight constraints experimentally on, on the way that uh, the universe works, right, at, at low energies. So especially tests within the, within the uh, solar system, uh, tests of orbits of satellites, um, and uh, you know precise timing, uh, pulsar timing experiments, uh, all of that, and really one of the most amazing things that's come out of this LIGO uh, gravitational wave experiments, right, is is uh, are some of the things that that test general relativity, test this the speed of gravity, uh, which Einstein says should should be the speed of light, and so we've combined uh, gravity with uh, measurements of gravitational waves with uh with uh, optical uh information coming from uh you know bursts right gamma rays and things and we can we can test and we can see that uh gravity does in fact seem to travel uh at the speed of light which is einstein's prediction um so there's a class of anytime, theories, you, but... anytime you modify gravity in some way right you we you tend to screw up one of these types of things either either uh, wow. these these observations and so it's very hard to do it so I, I can't tell you I have a um, a favorite modified theory of gravity at all uh, but uh, but there are things to play with there are puzzles that are unanswered within Einstein gravity that certainly warrant us uh, to look 
deeper and, and try to understand, right? Like the fact that the universe is accelerating today, something we don't really understand within Einstein gravity. There's one class of theories that I've uh, been dabbling around in, uh, and these are um, theories where space-time is not continuous. You know, I showed this space-time foam uh, with the implication that you could go down to arbitrarily small distances, and it may get foamy, but it would still be a sort of continuum. Um, but for a long time, uh, there's been the idea that maybe there's a sort of discrete uh, substructure uh, in the case of time, that sometimes they're called chronons, uh, little units of time, uh, so that the unfolding universe is not uh, continuous, but like in a, in a movie, the old fashioned movie, one frame at a time, but flickering so fast, you don't notice the joints. Um, and a similar thing for space. Uh, and that's a drastic thing to do to space time, to in introduce a discrete substructure. So then you think, well, what are the observable consequences? And uh, you know, people are working on that and I'm trying to follow what they're doing. Now, um, we've only got three minutes. Uh, we're being asked any more events at LIGO? Yes, many more. I don't know what the latest count is, but we're into the dozens, I think, of black hole black hole encounters uh, one neutron star neutron star encounter and i think one neutron star black hole um i'm going through very fast now um uh, uh somebody's asking about the prospects really for uh, potential research in wormholes well um at the moment it's a sort of hobby a distraction uh, for some people uh, I think uh, it would be nice to have um, a little bit more attention given some of the questions we're giving. Uh, what implications does it have for society? Well, of course, if it was established that time travel was possible, all bets are off thereafter. There could be no, uh, no more disruptive discovery about the nature of the universe. But I think uh, we're, we're a long way from that. Um, uh, now, uh, Hunter Reeves is asking, a bug floating on a pond will be pushed away by ripples. How does gravity act as a purely attractive way? Oh, that's a whole lecture in its own right, and we don't have time to get into it here. But basically, when a gravitational wave goes through you, it stretches you lengthwise and shrinks you widthwise. And then when the next cycle of the wave, the next half cycle comes through, it stretches you widthwise and shrinks you um, lengthwise. And that sort of uh, process like that can uh, can cause the arms of the interferometer to move by a tiny, tiny amount that is measured with a laser. Um, Hawking radiation, would that affect a wormhole? Uh, no. So a wormhole is not going to emit uh, thermal radiation, uh, but they may, it may create quantum particles, but it would have a very different form. A black hole is a very pure, simple thing that has a very pure, simple spectrum. A black hole, a wormhole would be very different. Um, and I think uh, everyone else is asking uh, to us to talk about much more complicated things. So I think <laughs> we're going to have to leave it there um, uh, because we are indeed out of time, are we not, uh, Jessica? You're the boss here. Um, well, we are at the end of the hour, so. Right. Uh, and I think quite apart from anything else, uh, people probably are going to have, have dinner. Um, and. Uh, and so, uh, as we are lacking our usual moderator, it falls to me to thank uh, Damien for uh, playing the game so well and agreeing to come on and ask a visitor. That's a pleasure uh, to be here. <laughs> and uh, Jessica for moderating it with a plum, as ever. Uh, well, uh, from behind the scenes, moderating it. And, uh, and you, the audience, who I hope we will remain loyal and come back in one month's time to hear uh, the topic of that occasion, which uh, we have yet to zero in on, but it will be something exciting and provocative as ever. So just remains for me to uh, bid you all good night and uh, see you in a month. Bye. Bye. Bye.